Loving in your home. My guess is that every person in this room knows that our homes should be characterized by love. But my second guess is that every person in this room also knows that our homes aren't always characterized by love. This morning, we want to begin our time asking ourselves, how do we make sure that our homes are what they should be? How do we make sure that our homes are characterized by love? And the Bible points us to one word to get us started in our answer. So look to the screen at Titus 2.4, which says, And so train, train the young women to love their husbands and children. Ladies, the Bible acknowledges that we don't automatically love in our homes. We don't automatically have this figured out. In fact, the Bible says that we need to be trained. Isn't that interesting? We need to be trained. We need to be encouraged, advised, urged, and shown how to love our husbands and children. It's okay if you look at the relationships in your home and you recognize, I don't know how to always love rightly. How do I love when I am tired and overwhelmed or on my period? How do I love when the people in my home are fighting and arguing? How do I love when my aging husband is in pain and discomfort much of the time? How do I love when I don't feel warmth toward the individuals in my home? How do I love when? Well, the Bible says we need training. Meaning, encouragement, being advised, urged, and shown how to love when. And even in the best of times, even when your love is going well, how do we still excel more? How do we make sure that we hit the target over the long haul of our lives? How do we make sure that we don't get knocked off in our love? No matter our age, no matter our energy level, and no matter our circumstances, How do we make sure that we are loving for the rest of our days? That's what we want to answer for our lives today. Whether some of this is review for you or it's brand new, we want to be encouraged, advised, urged, and shown today, and then actually go do it. So our starting point to effectively love in our homes, jot down for point number one, spot the threats that will hinder your love at home. Ladies, there are daily threats that you need to get good at spotting in your home that will otherwise knock you off track and prevent you and hinder you from loving in your home. We are going to quickly walk through seven threats that I want you to jot down because these things will stunt your love for your husband, for your children, for your roommates, for your siblings, for your parents, whoever it is that you're rubbing shoulders with on a day-to-day basis in your home, these will stunt your love for them. The starting place is dash one, selfishness. Ladies, you, me, we've all been there, right? You've been there, I've been there, we've all been there, and we're not done being there because selfishness is the pull of gravity on our hearts and minds, right? To plunge deep into the pits of selfishness. That is the natural pull on our hearts. And there are two forces that are constantly urging us to be selfish. And the first is the world's messaging. What's valued in our culture? What's the messaging to women? Independence, a culture of me, selfishness. The culture will applaud you for being all about you. And its messaging says to be all about you because you deserve it. Now, the second force encouraging selfishness in our lives are the desires of our own flesh. Not only is the culture saying it, but our flesh is agreeing with it. Your flesh is bent to consider yourself first. Your flesh most naturally views everything through the lens of yourself first. And even if you are new creations in Christ, we still are encased in a fallen human body. Until we are glorified, we must fight to be sanctified. Well, the second threat 
is usurping your husband's authority. For those that are married, I have no doubt that there are ways God has given you strengths where your husband has weaknesses, and he has given you weaknesses where your husband has strengths. There will be areas where you have more experience, knowledge, skill, even giftedness, and God still commands you to submit in everything to your own husband. That means even when you're making decisions about that precious newborn baby that has entered into your home, submit in everything to your husband. Even when you're making decisions about finances and you are better with money or have that as your background, submit in everything to your husband. Even when you want a certain schooling choice or a home project done, a life change or a particular decision made, submit in everything to your husband. Of course, be his helper. Of course, speak your desires respectfully and clearly. But then when he makes a decision, submit to him. The third dash and the third threat is your own attitude. As women in our homes, we have to pay careful attention to the threats that we bring into our quarters through our own attitudes. Our attitudes can keep us from loving in our home, and they can even repel the people that we want to draw near, can repel them away from us. Anger, fear, being weary, impatience, depression, anxiety, being cold— Even if your personality is naturally bent and prone to some of those dispositions, if we lean into the ways that we are prone, we threaten the relationships in our home. We threaten love from reigning in our home. But here's the good news. A sinful attitude, it has no dominion over you if you are new in Christ. You are 100% of the time able to say no to a sinful attitude, and to instead say yes to righteousness. To look at that fork in the road and choose, I am going to honor Christ with my attitude and not dishonor him. The next threat that you can jot down is neglect of spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines are so vital as a follower of Christ And your time in God's word, your persistence in prayer, your gathering with the body of Christ, your being in fellowship with other people, just to name a few spiritual disciplines, are so vital for you loving rightly in your own home. Neglect of spiritual disciplines weaken and erode your love for Christ and your love for others. Neglect of spiritual disciplines will calibrate your heart away from loving Christ and onto the things of the world. Neglect of spiritual disciplines, when left neglected, will alter the course of one's whole life. It'd be like being out at sea on a boat. When you are out at sea on a boat, when you step foot onto that boat, typically there's a plan to go from point A to point B. There's a plan, there's a course that you are trying to go on, that the captain of the ship is taking you on. Now, what happens if a few days into that journey, being out at sea, maybe you're on a cruise ship, maybe you're just out for a few hours in the harbor when you came from where you moved from, or maybe even out here on one of our lakes around, right? Out there on a boat. Well, what happens if a few days or even a few hours into that journey, the captain, the driver decides, I'm just gonna abandon the plans. I'm just going to neglect the plans. I'm just gonna drift. I'm just going to no longer engage the motor and look at the coordinates and follow the course and the plan, and instead I'm going to just be. Does that boat stay right there? Of course not. There's nothing anchoring that ship to that particular plan anymore. There's nothing propelling it forward in the way that it should go. And with not much time, the entire course of that ship or that boat is knocked off course from where it had planned to go. And if that neglect continues, that boat drifts further and further away. The pole of the current, the winds moving, it takes the boat to its own choosing. It takes it to the place of its own desires. This is the picture of a life that neglects spiritual disciplines. From subtle ways to drastic ways, your mind is moved 
your heart is weakened. Your love and resolve erodes away and you're pulled further and further off course, away from loving Christ and loving those around you. So we all need to see neglect of spiritual disciplines as a threat and not a friend. Well, the next way is misplaced priorities. Each one of us needs to prayerfully examine where our priorities lie. Is your home your priority? Meaning the souls and the management of it. Or have your priorities been placed somewhere else? Some diagnostic questions to ask yourself as you consider this is what's receiving the best of you? What's getting your creativity and your thoughtfulness and your hard work? Are there areas that slip through the cracks? And if so, where? When you think of misplaced priorities, there's no one size fits all for this. And that's why we each have to examine our own lives carefully. Because some of you have greater responsibilities in your home and greater demands in your home, whereas others have less. That's just the way it goes. And so everyone has varying demands and also varying resources for what they need to do in their life. But the Bible is clear. Women are designed with a domestic role. Titus 2 calls us to be workers in our homes. The Proverbs 31 woman looks well to the ways of her household. Even when she is seen making a profit, it is not to the neglect of her home. It is to the priority and kind of coming alongside the priority of her home. So when your schedule is too full, when your commitments are too many, when you're away more than your home responsibilities require, When you can't have a faithful, quiet time because there's no time, then your priorities have been misplaced. Consider what needs to be adjusted and changed and align your life to God's design. Well, the next threat, number six, is idolatry. Anything good can become an idol. What was once not an idol can become an idol over time. And for many women... Their husbands and their children and their homes are perfectly poised to become an idol. An idol is anything that you desire or trust more than God. When someone rises or falls based on their husband or their children or what's happening in the beauty of their home, when someone's driving force is to pour everything into their kids or their marriage and their finances, schedules, time, words all start to revolve around them, you might be in the danger zone of idolatry in your home. Idolatry in your home shows that you are more focused on you and what you want than on biblically displaying love in your home. And part of why this is not going to help you is because these souls will never be able to deliver for you. There will be frustration because what you are wanting from them is not even possible for them to give to you. They can't satisfy the longings and the cravings that only God can satisfy. And lastly, ingratitude. Ingratitude is far too easily a trap that we fall into, where instead of thanking God for the countless blessings that he has given us, we begin to complain. Yes, sickness is hard. Yes, life is challenging. Yes, aging and health concerns aren't ideal. Yes, home responsibilities can be very demanding. Yes, this might not be where you envisioned yourself at this point in your life. But yes, hasn't God been good to you? Don't you have your needs met? Don't you have far more than you need? Ladies, ingratitude in our homes is a threat. Gratitude cannot exist alongside complaining. We are each surrounded by things we once begged God for and once thanked God for. So all that's changed is our own perspective when ingratitude begins to replace gratitude. So don't give in to that threat that will rob you of loving in your home. Well, now that we've sought to spot the threats that hinder your love at home, I want to draw your attention to what will help your love at home. Ephesians 2.10 gives us a new way to think. The text says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
The Bible teaches us that we've been created in Christ for good works. And he's actually prepared beforehand good works for us to go out and walk in day by day by day. Good works do not save us, but good works are, they, are the result of a saved life. So as you consider Titus 2.4 and loving your husband and children and being trained in that, as you consider Ephesians 2.10, being created in Christ Jesus for good works, jot down for point number two. Fill your home with good works that flow from an affectionate attitude. I'm sure everyone in the room has memories of going on a scavenger hunt, probably as a kid, right? Well, several months ago, my daughter had the opportunity to attend a birthday party. And this birthday party was a mystery-themed birthday party. And while she was out there on that scavenger hunt, or sorry, on the, at that birthday party, one of the activities was a scavenger hunt. And so as a group, these girls, they got to go outside and walk this route and be on the hunt to spot little figurines that were hidden ahead of time. You see, the older siblings of the birthday girl went out ahead of time and they prepared beforehand the way. And they hid all sorts of these little prized possessions for the girls to go out and find. And so, of course, these girls were on the hunt, right? They were looking in the grass and the bushes and in the trees, high and low and everywhere, because there were these prized possessions that they wanted to find. And here's the thing. They knew they were out there. They just had to find them. They just had to walk the path and grab them, and they wanted to. They were excited. They knew these things had value. This is the exact picture that I want you to carry out into your everyday lives. From the moment your eyes open in the morning to the moment you go to sleep at night, God has good works prepared beforehand for you to walk in. And we ought to be on the hunt, ready for the next good work and the next good work and the next good work because we know they are out there and God has them planned for us to walk in. Now, before we can do any good works for the Lord, he has to do his good work in us, right? Those that have been saved by grace now get to live carrying out good works in his power and for his glory. In John 15, 8, Jesus says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Filling our homes with good works that flow from an affectionate attitude Bring glory to the Father. Now, similar to a scavenger hunt, we can rightly go about our day looking for the next valued prize that we are knowing is prepared beforehand for us to walk in. Think about this throughout one's day. Maybe for you, it begins with the moment your alarm clock goes off and it's not hitting snooze, but it's aiming, if at all possible, to get up when your alarm goes off, when you had set it for, when you had chosen to get up. You waking up on time is a good work that leads to following after in more good works. Next, many of us begin the early hours of our morning seeking God's face in prayer and in our Bibles. That is the next good work to walk in. Not neglecting the priority of the Lord is the next good thing for you to do. How about beginning to greet those faces in your home that wake up with a good attitude? That is a good work that God has prepared for you to walk in. Or how about picking up toys, doing dishes, meal planning, grocery shopping, scrubbing your floors and toilets, caring for the aged, doing that thing that your husband keeps asking you to prioritize, fanning the flames of your own soul, reading that biography, working hard in your job, preparing dinner for someone in your church. The list goes on and on. These are good deeds for you to walk in, in his power and for his glory. But we also walked through seven threats earlier, and I want to wrap up our time by briefly just going through that list and showing you how filling your home with good deeds looks like the opposite of that list. So for starters, if selfishness is a threat— then selflessness is the path to walk in. Philippians 2.3 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, 
but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. When you operate selflessly in your home, you are doing a good deed and displaying love for the souls in your home. The second one, if usurping your husband's authority is a threat, then submission to his authority is the next good work for you to walk in. Ephesians 5.22 says, Wives, submit in everything to your own husbands as to the Lord. Number three, if a sinful attitude is a threat to loving in your home, then a godly attitude displays love for those in your home. Colossians 3 is full of attitudes to put on that are godly. Number four, if neglect of spiritual disciplines threatens your love, then pursuing spiritual disciplines displays your love for the Lord and is the next good deed for you to walk in. Psalm 27.4, jot that down as a good reference point. The fifth one, you must steer away from misplaced priorities to instead keep proper priorities. Properly prioritizing your home is God's good design for women. Proverbs 31, 27, and 28 says, She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Number six, making an idol of your home or the people in it is not love. But setting your affections on God allows you to rightly love his gifts. Deuteronomy 6, 5, to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And number seven, ingratitude will threaten your love at home, but gratitude is what will feed and nurture and bless your efforts to love in your home. The grateful person draws others in, and the grateful person is poised to let good works flow from an affectionate attitude. So ladies, as you go about loving in your homes, look for those threats that will hinder your love. And then be on the hunt for those next good works that God has prepared for you to walk in. Let's go ahead and pray. God, we thank you for the privilege that it is to be designed to love those in our homes. God, we thank you that you have given us people in our lives, people in our homes, in our quarters, that we are called to love. And God, I pray that you would stir up our hearts, that you would help us to rightly love our husbands and children and roommates and family members and parents, whoever it is that we are rubbing shoulders with. God, would you help us to be on the hunt for those next good works to walk in, to be eager and joyful with a godly attitude, to carry out what you have called us to do. God, we thank you for this time in your word. We pray that you would continue to work in us, that you would change us, that we would honor you with our lives. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.